to have you here. Thanks. Happy to be here. And uh, hello to everybody out there that I can't see. Uh, I uh, hope there's somebody out there watching this. So We're here. <laughs> okay. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with, I, th I thought I, I originally thought I would just start with my dad's work, but I think it's in order to put this in some sort of context. I've had such a meandering um, trip through photography that I wanted to show some of my earlier work as a photojournalist. And I think that gives some context to what I'm doing now. So if you will just uh, bear with me with that, I'll, I'll start the show here. Oh, I need to uh, share the screen. Um, okay, here we go. Okay. So, Let's get this going. Um, okay, can you see that? Um, yes, yes. All right. So, forty years an idea. So this 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 project has been uh, with my dad's work. It's been forty years in the making, and and uh, and, and and we'll we'll go through everything that uh, how how it got to be. So this is my I'm actually my very first picture I made professionally. I was 17 working in a newspaper in, in, uh, in, Mus in uh, Muskogee, Oklahoma uh, as, a, as an intern. And uh, I think this is the first picture that I made that I really kind of understood what, how light works in photography. Uh, it was at a dance competition and, um, and uh, this young lady was tying her shoe and I slid across the floor to make this picture and it, it just worked out. Um, I'm going to skip over like a few years when I worked in Muskogee and then I worked at a newspaper in the Springfield News Leader. But this is the very first picture I made in um, uh, for, for uh, the Philadelphia Inquirer. And um, I think this is our 1990, uh, 1983. And uh, it was my first assignment and it was to go out and take a picture of this man who had a tiger in his backyard. And they said, go out and make a picture of this man. And I go out and the guy had a tiger in his backyard and he said it was in a cage. He said, come on in the cage. And I said, no way, I'm not going in there. And so he he said, he's harmless. I'll, look, I'll kiss him. And he did. And that was a picture at Randall, my very first front page picture for the Inquirer. Um, and then there's that guy um, who actually got uh, turned down for a, a, a uh, license at uh, in Atlantic City. Uh, so he, he I mean, he's got the Trump face that so we all know. We've all seen plenty of that. Um, but one of the great things I really loved about working at the Inquirer was the Sunny Magazine. Um, I was fortunate enough to have around 13 um, cover stories for the Sunny Magazine. And it was just a really, it was just a, I think it was an institution in the city. I mean, I think people still have some of those old Inquirer magazines. They were, they were, it was just, an, and it was just, a, it was an amazing, the Inquirer Magazine was just an amazing place to work for in a newspaper. Um, and it gave me a chance to do long form photojournalism, which I loved. Uh, one of my first stories was um, photographing a black church in Philadelphia. And I really tried to focus more on the black community in Philly, um, um, just because I felt like in our coverage of the black community, it was, it was okay, but I felt like it could have been better. And, and that was one of the things I could uh, lend to, uh, to our coverage of the city. So I did uh, several stories on uh, the black community in Philadelphia. This is a church in, Phil in West Philly. And all these are, there's many, 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 many more pictures to these, but I'm just gonna skim through these uh, stories as we go. This is Reverend Faust. He had a big uh, red cross in his, in his church in the ceiling. Um, I spent three months shooting this story. Um, another story I worked on was Double, du double Dutch. Um, which uh, was just an amazing thing. I'd never seen two rope, kids jumping with two ropes. It just, when I, I come in from Oklahoma, they don't do that out there. So, so it was fun to just kind of see this, but I couldn't, I couldn't figure out how to photograph this. So I ended up taking the girls into the studio one day. I painted a wall black, took them in the studio and uh, started do, doing things like this, multiple exposures. This is all on film. Uh, no, nothing digital at this time. These are all single exposures layered on, on one, one uh, 35 millimeter uh, piece of film. And again, there's many more pictures to this, this as well. Uh, we shot so many pictures that actually blew up a transformer in the, uh, in the building, which was my, which was really fun. Um, another story I worked on that was a, was a really long-term project. Uh, this bit, 
took about almost a year, maybe a little bit longer than a year, um, uh, was the drug scene in Philadelphia. And, uh, and the way this whole thing got started was uh, Life Magazine had come in, done a story that I thought really, it didn't represent the city well. And, and actually some of the pictures were actually made up. They were kind of sort of contrived. And so I um, asked my uh, editor, if uh, well, I had been working up there on some other stories just on my own anyway, and I, asked, I took some of the pictures I had um, in and they allowed me, they sort of uh, disconnected me from the staff and, 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 and team me up with David Zucchino, who was an amazing reporter. Um, uh, and we, we just hung out in North Philly and, uh, and made images. This was a story for the magazine. The story also ran in the daily section for uh, I think there were like 50 some odd pictures that ran over a week's period in the daily section. But this story that I'm showing you now was just from the Sunny Magazine. And it was on a family who had bought a house in North Philly uh, for a dollar on a street that was abandoned. Uh, they were the only fam legitimate family that lived on the street and the rest of the people that lived on the street were all uh, drug users. Um, this is what North Philly used to look like. I think now these are all luxury condos. So you can see where we've <laughs> Where we've been over over time, um, but it was just it was it was a wild place. I mean, it was it was really crazy. They you know they called it the Badlands. I mean, I have some actually I have some issues with the way the story now looking back on it. Um, the, you know, it was it was during the time of the whole uh, war on drugs thing, and I and it's it's interesting how how your concept of of these things change over time, but. Um, but that's where we were back in the eighties and um, or nineties rather. Um, and this woman was, ca was uh, caught um, by a, a, a sting operation buying uh, heroin with her, with her baby in the car. Um, this guy uh, was a used car salesman actually. And they, they uh, pulled him over and, and uh, um, um, a, a little piece of pop uh, heroin popped out of his shoe. Um, but uh, the story that oops, the story that um, that for the Sunday magazine was about this family that lived on the street. Um, it's called Stella Street. It doesn't exist anymore, and I'll show you. In a, I'll show you why. Um, this is what it looked like from the second floor of the Carter's house. The family that lived on the street. Turn off my alarm here. Um, um, we spent I don't know how many weeks or months up there photographing the family and just the street. Um, but to condense the story, Elle and I found out that, or City Hall found out that we were, we were had been working on the story, and they sent Elle and I up to uh, rustle everybody out of the street. They got everybody out of the, all of the drug houses, um, and they basically just tore down the street. Um, so that's the view after about uh, a week. They completely tore down the street. So if you go up there now, it's just a vacant, it's just a, it's just a vacant alley or a vacant uh, lot. Um, after working on that story, I felt I needed a little break. I needed something a little bit lighter. I wanted to do something in color. Most of my work is, has been in black and white. And so I found um, uh, some uh, cowboys and in, in, in inner city cowboys um, and um, started following them around. And, you know, the funny thing was, I mean, I grew up in Oklahoma. I'm familiar with cowboys. My family, I have a lot of, you know, uh, relatives who have ranches and, and, and uh, you know, do work with cattle and things like that. My grandfather was a working cowboy. Um, and uh, I, so it was familiar to me, but I was really, it was, I was really sort of dumbstruck when I found out when I moved out here that people did not know that there was such a thing as black cowboys. In fact, I was photographing uh, in New York, actually some cowboys up there and somebody stopped me and said, are those black cowboys? And I'm like, well, let's see, they're black and they're wearing a hat, so they must be cowboys. <laughs> so, you know, it's just, it's just funny that they didn't, it was, it was anyway. So I, so I photographed this story for uh, the Sunday Magazine. We got a ton of mail from this story. And uh, I uh, asked my editors if, if we could uh, go out and if I could go out around the country and, and find some more stories. So I did a five part series, four or five part series uh, for the, for the, for the, uh, for the uh, daily paper um, uh, uh, during Black History Month in 1983. Um, so we got, and again, there's a lot more pictures to this story, but um, these are just some from 
uh, little snippets from from the overall from the overall story. This is on a cattle drive in uh, in uh, Texas, just outside of Austin. This was the Okmulgee um, uh, Black Rodeo, which is one of the largest black rodeos in the in the country. I mean, they get thousands of people that show up at this place. It's it's really amazing. Um, so um, transition a little bit from the photojournalism into um, my fine art career world, whatever I'm doing now. Um, I, it got to the point where the paper had, had you know, they had lost money basically. We just didn't have the budget to travel. We didn't have the budget to do the long form uh, photojournalism. The um, magazine had gone away. So um, I just needed something else to do. I, I, I needed to just, I needed to shoot, but you know, the paper wasn't quite doing what I wanted it to do as far as my create creativity went. So I started playing around in the darkroom with some different techniques, different things, um, and um, wound up making art that people wanted to hang on their walls, which is really unique for me because, you know, my pictures for the paper were pictures that people put in the bird cages. <laughs> and nobody, I never really thought that somebody would actually want to see a picture hanging on the wall. So I started uh, playing around with my four by five camera, uh, making pictures of uh, just the city at night. Um, long, really long exposures uh, of the city at night. These are like 45 minute exposures. And, um, and uh, an accident happened in the dark room that allowed me to sort of get this sort of dreamy, creamy, fuzzy, uh, sort of pictorialist view of, of, of things. And uh, so I, I just went with that. And I did that for a few years, uh, different series from that. This is Columbia Bridge in, uh, on, uh, on uh, the Schuylkill. And uh, I mean, you know, you think timing is everything. I mean, those ducks were lined up along the way. And I was in my car when I saw the ducks down the creek. And literally, I pulled over on the side of the road, threw my camera up, put on the four by five, threw the hood on, put a slide in and made it right before they got to the little, uh, you know, shadow there, the reflection, because I think if they had made it into the reflection, it wouldn't be the same picture. So, and actually this is the first picture that uh, by this time I was, I was, uh, I was uh, showing with Sandy Webster gallery. And uh, I, I, at that time I was making editions of 10 and uh, this picture sold out. And I thought, wow, you know, like something would, somebody wanted, 10 of these, it was all, it was just, it was, it was all just fascinating to me. Um, while I was at um, Sandy Webster, uh, one of uh, her patrons who had collected some of my work wanted, to, had, had gone to Cuba and uh, asked Sandy if she knew of a photographer who would like to go down there and photograph Cuba. And this was before, uh, this was 2000, um, 1999, 2000. And um, uh, she recommended me and so I had a meeting with him and he was talking about the wonderful colored cars and the old women smoking cigars and, you know, and I said, well, I don't really want to do that. <laughs> I said, if I go down, I will shoot at night. I would prefer to shoot at night. I would prefer to shoot no people, no cars and no old women smoking cigarettes, uh, cigars. That was just my, my <laughs> and he went with it. So he paid uh, for my wife and I to go down and uh, spend literally a month over a couple of trips uh, photographing Cuba at night. And uh, it, we, we did a catalog with it. That's how we got around uh, down there. We didn't uh, have a cab or anything. We had uh, this busy taxi and our driver's name was, uh, was Ronaldo, who was just a wonderful guy. And we would load up all of our equipment on this thing and he would just haul us around town. Uh, I did shoot one car. This is the one car that I made. This picture is about a 45 minute exposure. Um, and those light bulbs, the lights that you see are probably 100 watt light bulbs. And, uh, it, and it was just a really, really super long exposure. And you can see there's a there's a couple of people sitting right there. There's a man, there was a man and a boy sitting there. And uh, I set my camera up and, and uh, I, I thought for sure they would get up and walk away. And they just sat there the whole time. It was amazing. They actually recorded on the film. Um, this is called Boy in the Malacan, which is a seawall that runs around Cuba. Um, this is a, I know this is a stark transition, but this is going to get me into another area that I, I really, really got into for, for, for a while. Um, I, I decided to just start 
Well, first I was assigned to do the story on the seed pods for the for the for the inquire. And uh, so I started playing with it with the scanner as a camera and just really got fascinated with it. And um, so that led me into um, be between some different, you know, things, taking my kids to the shore and we would throw throw shells on the scanner and scan them. And I started seeing patterns in there and they reminded me of space. So I started doing things where I would put things on the scanner and uh, and, and and try and think uh, um, sort of reimagine what the Hubble Space Telescope would see. And I did this over a really cold winter and I would set out and and just make these things. And I felt as if, you know, and it took a while for them to scan in because they were really large files. And so I felt like I was sitting, I imagined myself sitting at NASA, you know, watching images render from the Hubble. Um, I'm kind of a little bit of an astrophysics geek. I don't know anything about it. I just like to watch, look at the pictures, but it's, it, it just really amazes me. Um, so I did things like this. This, this is, uh, you know, an egg, but um, it just reminded me of some celestial planet. Uh, there's a whole series of these. Um, this is another egg. I, I actually, I painted this egg black, sunk it in, in um, uh, olive oil. Made, I made a little contraption of uh, a clear uh, a container that had a clear bottom, put the egg in olive oil and uh, lit it from underneath. And it was, it was, a, it was a, <laughs> nobody should do this. You're really sick if you do this kind of stuff. But it, it, it took a while to figure it out, but it was so much fun. I had so much fun doing this. Um, and uh, it, it, it won a, 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 a part of the uh, Woodmere uh, uh, third annual um, uh, triennial. So this is the exhibit. But the most exciting part is that I made this image. This is actually a piece of uh, egg. It's an egg yolk from another from another image I was working with that had dried on a piece of plate glass. And so I, I decided to just sample the little pieces of, of egg yolk. And um, and I found this image and I saw, I, I, I titled it Grand uh, Nebula. And the crowning glory is that it got picked up by Google. So now it's in all this, the uh, Hubble images as Grand Nebula, which is like, yay, that's all I, that's all I need. I can die happy now. Um, the We Were There book, um, so, uh, uh, colleague of mine at the, uh, in, at, she actually, she worked for the Daily News, asked me if I would want to work on this project with her uh, about African-American African veterans. And at, at the time, there had never been a book about Black veterans. And so we were lucky enough to get a contract with HarperCollins. And we went across the country and found Black veterans and told their stories. And uh, the book got a lot of, it got, it got a pretty good acclaim. We, it went through three editions. It's still out there on, on Amazon. Um, but it was just it was just meeting these men and, and women that were it was just a powerful experience. Most of them now are, are passed away, especially the World War II people. Um, but uh, just hearing the stories, it was just it was just something else. Um, this guy, um, um, uh, oh man, I'm blanking on his name now. Anyway, he had a uh, he lived in Florence, New Jersey, and. Um, I called him up and I said, can I come and photograph you? And he goes, yeah, well we, well, we can take it out by my tank. And I'm like, wait, you have a tank? He goes, yeah, I have a tank and a jet. <laughs> I'm like, okay, let's do it. And so we go out there and, he, and, he, and he, he, he had a tank that the government had given him and a jet and he had made a park in, uh, in, 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 uh, in this little town. And uh, he, he posed by his tank and he looks like a tank. I mean, he was just really well fortified guy. Um, and this man had such a tragic story to me. I mean, he had gone to Vietnam and uh, I, uh, not to get into the whole story, but um, Vietnam and literally just, I think sapped him of his, his, I wouldn't say his will, but he had, something wasn't there. I, it just, you could tell just something wasn't there. So he had a flag hanging out in, in front of his house and I, he stood behind the, the flag and sort of symbolic of, of, you know, how the flag sort of just really cut him in half or how the country cut him in half or the war, however you want to look at it. Um, that's, that uh, um, book became a, uh, an exhibit at the uh, National Constitution Center. And uh, we had a big gala for 
the vets, I think about 500 people showed up the, and the vets it, were honored there. And it was really, it was really great. I was really happy for them because a lot of these men had, and women had never been, had never been honored in that, in that capacity before. So this gets us to my uh, photographs with my dad. So this is a, a, a photograph of my dad that he made, or he, I don't know if he made this or somebody else took it. I, I've heard sort of both stories, but I think he had this made when he worked in California in 1944. <clears throat> he went out and worked in the war. This is a picture I made of them um, um, you know, a few years ago. I, I'm, I, yeah, I'm not exactly sure when I'm how old they were, but it was it was a few it was a few years before my father passed away first and my mom. Then this is our house I grew up in in, in uh, Fort Gibson, Oklahoma. Um, but um, so the reason I started working on this story is I'd, I'd had this big container of images um, that my dad had made for years. And uh, when they passed away, they, my brother uh, who lives there sold the house and, um, and I got all my dad's archive, uh, his images, his photographs and his negatives that uh, actually I had rearranged, had cataloged all of his negatives for their 50th. 50th or 60th, 50th anniversary, no, 60th anniversary. And uh, I gave them to my dad and um, he, my dad was not somebody, I'm still trying to figure him out. And I think I'm sort of figuring him out through working with these images actually, because he was, uh, he was a little bit of a conundrum. I mean, he was, I thought he was just a brilliant man. He was a very smart, intelligent guy. Um, I came later in their life, so, my brother is 25 years older than I am. Um, so he had a different experience that I had with my father. Um, so it's, 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 it's just been, you know, it's been, it's been a, sort of a journey with these photographs and wondering like, why did he make these and how did he make these and um, trying to figure out how they connect to today's time. So I had um, started uh, in my MFA program at uh, the University of, of the Arts and I needed a project that I could do in the studio. So I started thinking about these images and um, again, how, how can I connect these images to today? And uh, I went through all different kinds of experiments and, 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 and ways of thinking about this. And uh, slowly things started to rise, sort of, sort of started start to bubble up, you know, especially with, uh, this is before all the incidents happened with George Floyd or any of the, you know, Breonna Taylor, or any of the, this is in 19, 19 uh, or 20, 2016 that I started these. Um, so these are some of the images out of his book. For some reason, he stapled them in the book, which I, again, I don't know why he did that. But so I now have the, all these staples to deal with, but you know, it becomes part of the image. So how do you work that, that into uh, the image? But really, Really, I think very poignant photos of, of, of uh, portraits. He did mostly portraits from what I'm getting at. Actually, this is my mother, um, I guess in the, in the 40s. Um, so I wanted to do something where I paid, I paid a, uh, and uh, I honored the community of Fort Gibson. Uh, Fort Gibson um, was uh, from, what I gathered at the time is was part black and part white, almost 50-50. And after talking with friends and relatives down there, there wasn't a lot of racial tension in this in this in the town that I can find. Uh, although it was surrounded by towns where there was a lot of attention, a lot of uh, racial tension, um, sundown towns, and and um, you weren't welcomed in some of the towns that surrounded Fort Gibson. So these pictures don't necessarily reflect what was going on in Fort Gibson, um, although he made the pictures at a time when Jim Crow was the law of the land. So, you know, I have to, I have to sort of process all that and realize that uh, one of the things I realized right off the bat that I really didn't want to know who these people were when I photographed them, because then I realized a lot of them are, are my relatives and and uh, but I, I didn't really want to know because I didn't really want it, that to affect how what I made with the images and and a few images have I have found out who they were 
and um and it it's you know it gets a little weird because <laughs> i sort of built up a relationship with them in one way and then i found out who they are and then that sort of changes everything so uh, I have to be really careful not to find out who these people are, which is um, has has been a little tricky. But what I wanted to do was I wanted to photograph these uh, these people and, and make something that would show um, the community as this thriving community, um, but almost invisible. The way I think a lot of black towns were back then. There were there were there were lots of black towns, but especially in Oklahoma, where there were a lot of black towns. Uh, I think Oklahoma, Oklahoma had um, uh, the highest percentage of black incorporated towns in the in the in the country, and <laughs> so I wanted something that would reflect that. But I I didn't want to make just straight portraits. I wanted to to make images that reflected sort of that resilience, but also the fragility of the community. So I started photographing them with uh, using. Um, um, reflected light behind uh, a plate uh, that I had adhered, that I'd made a digital negative, adhered the negative to plate with, with uh, to this glass plate and then photographed it. Um, this is one of the images that, that started out normal, uh, turned it into a negative, and then through the process of, of photo photographing it, backlighting it, photographing it, I, I got results like this. So these aren't these aren't Photoshop tricks. These are all chemical chemically altered uh, images. But I wanted to um, have the images almost appear ghost-like. Um, and so what I did was I put them all on. This is another one. And the patterns always change. I never knew what the patterns were going to be just due to the to the nature of the the adhesive. Um, so I made this installation and. Uh, again, I call this community, and what it is, it, it's all different ages, different genders, uh, different stages in life of the community. Um, and I put them on uh, these white um, uh, shelves because I was thinking about, um, um, sorry, I'm having a brain burp here, um, Bell Hooks, and uh, her um, her essay in in our times, where she talked about um, uh, how you know back in the day blacks weren't allowed in to um, museums or place cultural institutions, so they curated their own uh, uh, exhibitions, if you want to call them that, on their on their walls. And uh, so I, the shelves sort of reflect that idea that these are these are images that would be hanging on 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 in a black family's wall. They're 24 by 24 um, plate glass um, with uh, 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 with the image adhered to the back. And so I wanted to have that glass because to me glass reflects the idea of resilience but it's also fragile it can shatter and it's just like this community did and shatter and the pieces scattered all over the all over the uh, the country and I consider myself one of those pieces I I I moved away and 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 the community doesn't exist anymore so now the town is predominantly white um, I found this picture and uh, these people they just they just reminded me of like you know Dust Bowl settlers. Um, and I thought about it, like, what could I do with this? And so I built this set in my uh, studio and I wanted to make a scene where they were, uh, had, I sort of built up this backstory where they had left the planet because of whatever reasons you can think of. I mean, environmental reasons, social um, strife, uh, you know, police actions, for whatever reason, they just decided they needed to leave the planet. And uh, I made this image and um, I call this homesteaders. And uh, so they, you know, sort of, they've sort of landed on this barren planet um, and they have to make a new life. And uh, I think <laughs> over the last four years, I mean, I think some of us have sort of felt that. <laughs> so it's, it, it, it reflects that, but this picture was made um, prior to what, what, has hap what has taken place over the last few years. But um, but again, thinking about the idea that you know uh, when people traveled on the Underground Railroad, they traveled at night under the stars. So the stars became a motif in in in, in several of my images. 
uh, I saw this picture of this little girl and just fell in love with her face. And again, I don't know who she is, but I just she just had the sweetest face in the world. And I wanted to do something with with her. And so what I did was I made this picture. And um, so this is a layered image. Um, I call it Flower Girl. Um, and uh, I wanted to point towards the idea of, of just youthful innocence. And I think at the time, you think about Ruby Bridges, you think about Picola in uh, The Bluest Eye, where girls just didn't have that opportunity to have that innocence. Um, so I, uh, I made this image um, uh, pointing towards those examples. Uh, I saw this picture and I thought, wow, what, what I, and I couldn't figure out what was going on here. I, it must be a funeral, but I couldn't see anything in the background. There's, there was nothing in the foreground. It was just these people paying some sort of reverence to something. I didn't know what it was. And so um, I thought that um, uh, I cut them out, um, put them on my, on, on a, on a bed of, of, uh, you know, grass I got at Michael's really. And, uh, and, and then played around with the ideas about what they could be doing there. And I went, this went through several iterations, but what, what I wound up with was, was this. And the frames have a lot to do with how the images work, how the images operate. Um, I had actually uh, had a show uh, coming up and, and I was gonna, I'd, I'd gone down to order some frames and the frames were gonna cost like a lot of money. They were gonna cost like a couple of thousand dollars for frames. Which I was willing to pay, but I but I just wasn't happy with. I didn't. To me, it felt like these images didn't need to be in contemporary frames. They needed to have their own special container, and it to me it needed to be a vintage container. So I was at a thrift shop one day, and I started looking around. And I thought, wow, these frames are really nice. And you know, I found this frame, found another frame, I found, and in fact, I found just about all the frames I needed for the show. And so rather than print the images and then buy the frames. I bought the frames and printed the images to the frames. And it just seemed like they, there was just a nice conversation with the, with, with the image in the frame. Um, in this case, um, you know, the, I sort of see these people um, sort of staring off into an uncertain future, you know, again, under starry skies and uh, either wondering or paying uh, reverence to something, but whatever's going on there, um, it's either, it's either, it could be either a, a, a harbinger of doom or um, of hope. It depends on how you want to interpret it. Uh, I found this picture of this family and, uh, you know, it's like the typical family, you know, like they're standing in front of the car, they're in their sunny clothes, they're, you know, posing. Um, but it was just one of those images that you would not see in advertising. Like, you know, back in the forties and fifties, you would not see the, the black nuclear family uh, posing in front of their brand new Buick. And so um, I went to the studio, cut them out, and I made this picture. It's called, I call it Invisible Family, um, that again, sort of points towards that time when you didn't see the nuclear family. In fact, what you read from the media at the time was that there was no such thing as a, as a, as a, as a black nuclear family. So I wanted to, uh, to think about that when I made this image. Um, and I found, again, this woman who I fell in love with, and there was just something about her face. I mean, I did, I've done so many things with this picture. I later found out she was my, she is my aunt, which makes me feel really creepy. But I just think it's just an amazing picture. Um, and again, I've, you know, I've played around so many, with so many ways to, to think about this picture. But um, I started thinking, and I, and I know who, I know, she had this, I, I remember when I was a kid, she just had this beautiful, beautiful skin, very light colored, what you'd call high yellow, you know, if back in the day. And um, I started thinking about her skin. I started thinking about the brown bag test, which is a test that, um, that um, uh, was, get, well, it wasn't given, I guess it was just sort of a social construct that if you were, um, lighter than a brown bag, you had a certain elevated status in your community. Um, if you're darker than a brown paper bag, you were sort of looked down upon. And that's just kind of the way it was. And then actually in today's world, it's kind of that way a little bit, you know? I mean, darker skinned people just, um, I have this conversation with my daughter sometimes and uh, she runs into this at work. Um, she's mixed race, but she pushes to have 
um, darker skinned people represented in the, in the advertising of their of their the company that she works for, and uh, she's had pushback on that. And I just find that amazing in this day and age that that still makes a difference. And if you look at who's represented on television, it's mostly lighter skinned people. So um, what I did was I I we have a laser cutter laser. Um, uh, not a laser cutter, but a laser uh, printer at work. And I I, uh, I burned this image into a brown bag and I wanted to burn it rather than print it or coat it with ink because I wanted the act of that burning to be a symbol for the violence that was sort of subjugated upon black people uh, throughout time, really. And so this image is indelible into this, into this, into this print and they can't be separate, separated away, it can't be wiped away. It is part of the print, just as much as this woman's skin is part of her. Um, I started thinking about my mom's dresser and I did a series of, of, of my mom's uh, room, bedroom for a book that Deborah Willis did a few years ago on the black family. And uh, this is her dresser. She always had things really nicely arranged and she was, uh, she collected weird stuff like I do. I mean, she had buttons and who knows what's in there, but she had all these things. And I always, I always loved just looking at her dresser. And so thinking about, you know, like the, 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 the that curio frame, I, I'm not exactly sure what you would call it, but the frame that had the, the stand that would hold the picture up on, on desk, on, 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 um, on desk. And so um, I found this picture of this woman and uh, um, she just had this attitude, you know, it's, I just loved her, the way she had her head cocked and her, just her whole position. So I, um, I, I originally I cut her out because I wanted to see, I wanted to just through sheer will, will she pulled herself out of this picture. And uh, I, I, I thought that if anybody could do that, this woman could do it. Um, but it also sort of pays uh, homage to um, just the, the, the will of, of uh, Black women, because Black women pretty much ran the community. I mean, I know when I would go to church, it would be all women, and they were my role models. I mean, they were how, they were how everything was sort of, the community was sort of shaped around them. So um, I found this frame at a, at a thrift store. And um, actually, I think it was a mirror, but I thought it, it worked really well as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a frame for her. So this frame is about, it's 53 inches tall. So it's, it's really big. And I put her in, in this, um, it's got the back. I made a back for it. So it sets on, it sets up like, like, a, uh, like a, one, of those, one of those desk frames but it's big and it's, it's an imposing and, um, and I think it just fits her personality. <coughs> uh, this man uh, surfaced. And at the time my cousin was visiting my studio and her son said, um, and she's, I think his, his name is Frank. And uh, my son said, oh, it looks like he'd been chased. And I thought, wow, man, that's really something, you know, because his pants are really muddy and he's taken at night against this fence. And I thought, well, what can I do with this? And so what I did was I made this image where he's um, sort of trapped in that spotlight of, of, a, of a surveillance camera or, a, or maybe the spotlight from a helicopter. And, you know, sort of the what um, a lot of, black men and women, brown men and women happens, you know? And I, I wanted to, um, uh, to think about that. Um, my dad made this picture of this woman in the middle of the road. And I just, um, I was thinking about, you know, how, um, I don't know, for some reason, I just thought, of, I, I, I thought about my mother who um, worked as a domestic for a, um, a, a big attorney in town. And she also had a hair business. She was also really active in her church. Um, she and my dad had, they had a, it, it was a difficult marriage I, to say, you know, I mean, I felt that I got out lucky, 
but um, it, they had they had a difficult marriage. But I think she made she made the best of it. Um, but I just found this woman, and something, something about her sort of being stuck in the middle of all these different situations. And so I made this picture, and I call this woman in the middle. Um, I saw this picture that was kind of overexposed, but um, it has sort of this ghost-like feeling to, to me. And the couple seems really happy. Um, and I started thinking about uh, it is, for one thing, it's really bright. Um, this woman, you know, the, I don't know if the couple had had children at the time, but she could have, they could have had children. They could have, she could have been pregnant. I don't know. But, um, but I thought, sort of thinking about the one drop rule and how um, if you had one drop of black in you, you were considered black back then. And um, so I made this picture with that in mind. So I just put a single drop of of um, it's fake blood, it's not real blood, but in the middle of that to, um, to think about that idea of, of the one drop rule and how um, it and the effect it had on, on people. Um, I found this picture of these, these uh, two little white girls um, and um, you know, I didn't know what I should do about this, but um, with all the talk about white privilege, I wanted to use the picture to, to make a comment on that. And so I made this picture and um, what it is, and, I, and, I, and, I, and this has been back and forth for, for a long time. And I've been thinking about this and like, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm happy with it, but it's, it's, where, it's what I have right now. But I wanted to think about the idea of white privilege and how uh, it, 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 it sets a stage for itself, hence the curtains, but it's surrounded by this idea of this sort of myth, this mythology of black bodies out to get everybody. And, uh, and I was thinking about, um, you know, some of the ads that ran during the, uh, during the campaign where there would, there was, there was always, um, a young white woman running down the some you know sidewalk or something, or a young white woman that seems like she's being chased and she has to hide and call nine one one or something. Um, but this whole perceived notion that you know the suburbs are going to be taken over by Antifa and 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 BLM and and all those kind of things. So I made this image thinking about all of that and uh, how um, uh, white privilege has sort of set the stage for how everything works, how this country works um, with this, with this mythology of, 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 of um, uh, black bodies always lurking off in the, in the, in the distance somewhere. So this work um, won uh, a, a solo uh, show for the print center um, exhibition back right before COVID actually. And uh, I was really, honored to, to have that experience. So these are some, some uh, exhibition photos from, from, the, from that. And that's it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Ron. That was amazing. Thank you. So, can oh. I go home now? Oh, I am at home. No, Never mind. Yeah. Let's, <laughs> question. Let's do some questions. There was a question earlier on. I'm just going to read it from the chat from Sarah. I'm curious what Ron thinks about folks now collecting and publishing work of family archives of Black folks now trending. Oh, what do I think about it? You like black archives and those like websites and places like that? Is is, is that what we're talking about? Yeah, I, I yeah. would imagine, Sarah. If there's any any other clarification, you can unmute yourself and 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 um, clarify your question. Well, first of all, thank you for doing this. The work is really wonderful. I'd known your early photojournalism work and had known any of this so this is great no just that you know if you look at instagram there's all these new black archives and i mm -hmm. and i know you know people are collecting and it's just it's become so trendy now 
in a, in well, a- I mean, I mean, yeah, you could, I guess you could say it's Trinity, but I think it's important. I think it's important to recognize, you know, that that there there is this that there is this vast black archive out there, and uh, uh, there's women. I think she's in Chicago. In fact, I've posted some some of my work there. No, I, I know I know her, and she's she's published some of my images. Yeah, um, yeah. And I think she's great. I just it's a question of. I photograph in a lot of black communities and there was a university that was coming and collecting the archives from the families. And Mm -hmm. no, I kind of don't know. I don't think it's right. And I just was curious because you're doing all this work with your family work and your archive. And I'm I'm thinking of what you would, uh, just your thoughts on it. Yeah. Well, I'm just curious why you wouldn't think it, why would it, why wouldn't it be right? Oh no. I, I think it's, I think it's right. Just, I wonder when the if it's when it, if the photographs are taken from the family and not given back. That's kind of mm-hmm. what I'm questioning. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, you know, I I guess my 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 knee jerk reaction is that I would rather see those images archived someplace where they're going to be, be protected, as opposed to what happened with a lot of black family albums and things that just got destroyed or thrown away or and it just lost so you know um the smithsonian collected a lot of i mean they were they made a huge effort to go out and collect black you know ephemera and and uh, archives so um, i i think i think it's important um and i think it's 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 good to have those to to build up this collection of black America and then hopefully somebody will connect all the dots you know I think we're just starting we're just, this is really just started and to have that archive this vast archive I think over the years it's going to be really important because um, it's it's going to show a side of, of this country that has never been seen before Okay. No, I just wanted your opinion on it because yeah. your work is personal and, and you see it. It's just, you're, you're seeing it more and more. I think it's great. You just see it building and it's kind of like, okay, where's this mm-hmm. all been? I mean, cause it's so important. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. No, that's a good question. Thank yeah. You. Thank, thank you. you for your work. Thank you. Um, Vaughn, uh, I, I'm not sure I pronounced it right, but, uh, This person asks, can you talk a little bit more about your backgrounds, particularly about what looks like wallpaper? Uh, Well, actually, if you really want to know that, you mean the one, if you're talking about that picture of of the little girls, that was a picture of me nude. Nobody needs to know that. The secret stays here. (laughs) But that was a picture. picture (laughs) No, you don't want to know that. But um, yeah, I I needed, I needed, just so you know. What's that? We are on YouTube. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> you mean not the YouTube. No. Uh, so the other yeah. one. <laughs> the yeah. So yeah, so that was that was me. Yeah. And I needed I needed a body. And that was I carry this one around with me. I was a few pounds lighter than I am now, so it kind of worked, you know. Um, but yeah, that's 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 what it was. And I made that background and um with that actually that picture in mind and I sat around with it for actually three years and um and 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 that and that's where it's sort of landed here now you know it actually and it's been through another iteration too because I I made one picture where it it was the the hands but I inverted it so it almost looked reptilian and I didn't want it to be I wanted it to be a black body. I didn't want it to be anything else but that. So I, I've, I worked on it and, and turned it into just a, a human form. So uh, yeah, but yeah, that's that's what that's what it was. Thank you, um, Michaela. Asks um, the series is is titled "An Overdue Conversation with My Father." How did that conversation go? And do you feel like you have <coughs> a relationship with him? Yeah. Um, it's an ongoing conversation. I'm still trying to figure it out. I'm still trying to figure out my dad. And I, I was on, uh, actually I did, um, a friend of mine is a, is, is, he's a therapist and, uh, 
you know, we had a, and he, he's an artist and he's a therapist. And we, we had a conversation about this just recently. And, you know, it's like, you know, I don't know. My dad was a very complicated guy and he, um, I, you know, I, I just don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I know we all have sort of fraught relationships with our parents, maybe um, not everybody, but you know, some people. And um, so I'm still trying to work that out and I'm trying and you know, he's been gone now for 20 some odd years. So um, there's things that I just realized I'm going to carry with me for the rest of my life. And maybe this is some way to sort of work through some of that, um, you know, uh, sort of having conversations with him about his pictures. Um, because he's the reason I got into photography in the first place. I mean, I, I wouldn't have, I don't know what I would have done, which is something really scary to think about. But I became a photographer because of my father. And every every summer I would go in and um, he would have me wash all of his negatives and he would put them up in the dark room. He would hang them up in the dark room and then they would get dusty for another year. And then I would pull them down and wash them again. And so that cycle went on for a few years until I cut everything up and put them into a, a catalog. And and uh, cause I knew I was gonna get the photos. It's, I was gonna get those negatives. I mean, they were gonna be mine. <laughs> I didn't do it for him so much as for me. Um, so I'm, 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 you know, I'm still working through that. And I, and I, and I, I haven't, I've only been through maybe one or two pages of the negatives. I'm just really working with, with the photographs wow. now. So there's still a lot to work with. Um, Max writes, I think many people reflexively separate the techniques and workflow of photojournalism with a more multimedia and explorative style of photography. Do you feel that your versatility, versatility has been a result of your experience or that your own versatility has allowed for such an extensive experience within photography? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I think my, <laughs> I like that big word versatility. Yeah, that's really, that makes me sound really important. No, I just like photography. I just love photography. I like what photography does. You know, I'm just in love with photography. This is the only thing I've ever done in my, in my entire life is photography. I mean, I've built a couple of houses and stuff, but I, but photography has been everything for me. It's been, it's been, you know, it's been with me longer than any other relationship I've ever been with. Um, it's, it's, it's sustained me through some really tough times. I've had arguments with it. You know, I just have this relationship with photography and I love, I just love photography. So you know, I go where, I think I go where that little part of my brain takes me. And right now it's on this journey with my dad's work. And I have to say, I'm not, this is not something I really enjoy. I like picking up a camera and going out and making a picture. That's what I really love. But I feel like I need to do this. This is something that I really need to do. It's something that's needed to be done for a long time. And my goal is to have 20 images uh, made um, and we'll, see where it goes you know but it's it's all photography to me and uh, it's all about um about that process and that journey that photography takes you on yeah um so i guess i want to know i i really i mean because i was able lucky enough to see the show um in person at the print center, um, I want to. Uh, are you? Is what is the plans at this point um, to continue to make and get to those twenty images and then show, or do you have any plans for a physical show in the near future? Well, I'm talking with um, with a, a group in um, in um, Guernsey, England, right now. They have a photo festival over there, and uh, so we're 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 sort of in talks now to to do something over there. Um, I, I think the work will be shown in Oklahoma at the Oklahoma Contemporary Museum um, in May, but I don't know how COVID's going to affect that. But um, but yeah, I mean, there's a couple of shows out now that are that are in the um, in the in the offing. I'm also working on my Black Cowboys pictures and, and collecting those images. I mean, COVID has allowed me to scan like seven thousand of those images, so I'd really like to do a book on that. Um, so, you know, so there's a couple of those two projects and then there's a couple of little things sort of floating around out there. That's great. Are there any more questions for Ron?
I um, was pretty excited to see the seeds and the stars and the galaxies and uh, and also just the way even the images that you, the collages that you're making seem to cross dimensions, right? There are different planes of dimensions and, mm -hmm. and you're, and just this, I can see how it's all connected um, in this experimental part of your work. So yeah. that was really exciting for me. Yeah, that's one I read too. I'm thinking about how do I connect? I've made a couple images that I'm not really ready to show yet, but how do I connect that um, sort of that Afro futurism aspect to these images uh, and still not have it and not have it look contrived or hokey you know I did, but I'm still working I'm, I'm trying to figure out like now I'm trying to figure out like how do I connect the images I've made with my dad's images as opposed to making images with his images so you know the merging of those two bodies of work um, we'll see what happens I don't know but and it, these ideas usually come to me in the middle of the night so I, I never know <laughs> when it's going to hit. Um, really interesting. Uh, I was going to say, I love how you um, continue to experiment and think about and push, you know, what you know. Um, I think as an artist, that's an amazing um, thing to hold. Um, so many artists have their thing and they do their thing. But I think you continue to push yourself in, in new ways. Um, I think it's really exciting to see. Um, I really love, like Lori, Lori and I went together to see the show at the Print Center and I, I really love to see that work. Um, I've never seen anything like that in your work before. So it was, and it was uh, really beautiful to see. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Um, we're almost there, but I shall uh, suggest, when will you start a podcast talking about your ph photography? <laughs> <laughs> A podcast, she says. Yeah, right. Um, never. <laughs> Is that good enough for you? Never? No, I, yeah, I'm, I don't think, so. you know, I mean, no. I'm, I want to take pictures. I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to do this for a long time. So I hear that. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Ron. This is, such a great evening. I really loved um, this talk um, and I'm super honored that you could do that for us. Um, I also wanna let everybody know in the room that next week is our last talk of the year. It will be curator Dan Lears is gonna talk with Sarah Greenberger Rafferty about trying to put together an exhibition during COVID. Um, and I think it's gonna be an amazing conversation um, between the curator and the artist. Um, so I hope you'll come back next week. Thanks yeah. everyone. Oh uh, yeah, I wanna say thanks everyone. And thank you to Ron for not only being here for tonight, but Ron has been um, on the board of PPAC an advocate for PPAC um, since our very beginning. I remember seeing your work when I was in undergraduate school. Ah, uh, don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I'm no, 27. I'm 27. No, but I went late. I wasn't like young. <laughs> okay. I wasn't young at all. I oh, was okay. I was maybe like 30, maybe not, but close to. <laughs> but I just want to say thank you for being such an active um, member of our community and being such a supporter of PPA.